Welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, June 25th. Looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean, we see not a whole lot going on. Seas, 33 feet, are southeast of New Zealand, but they are all aimed due south, aimed directly at the Ross Ice Shelf, and not producing any swell energy radiating to the north. Likewise, another cutoff low is present in the Southeast Pacific. It is generating 24-foot seas, also aimed at Antarctica. All this suggests that a major ridging pattern is in play over the upper atmosphere. Let's dive into the details. As usual, we'll start our tour looking at jet stream level winds over the South Pacific Ocean. These winds, up about 30,000 feet, help support the formation of gales when those gales form, help direct their track. We're looking for a dip in the jet, in this case in the southern hemisphere, a dip would be pushing to the north. That would help support a clockwise flow aloft, and that is the hallmark of low pressure. Okay. Also, it would create low pressure down on the surface. Surface, of course, low pressure generates winds, winds generate seas, and seas, when they radiate away from the fetch area, produce swell. But what we have instead is no troughs. We have a ridging pattern. That is the opposite of a trough. Winds pushing southeast over the entire width of the South Pacific Ocean, pushing into Antarctica. All that helps to do, and notice the northern branch here is up at uh, 30 south, southern branch down here at 70 south, big gap in between. It's called a split jet stream flow. Zonal pattern, because there are no troughs, it's pretty much running flat to the east in in both streams sets up a big gap in between the two uh, j streams of the jet and that in turn creates high pressure and high pressure of course doesn't do much for generating surf let's look into the future we roll this out ridging pattern continues you see the southern branch this is the important one here just diving southeast under new zealand and continuing the whole way across the south pacific so we'll just roll this out and see looking for any sort of a change and then finally somewhere around thursday night we see Maybe the hints, the beginning of some sort of a pattern, maybe a trough, a little bit of a dip here, trying to develop and getting more uh, pronounced later into Friday. Winds building here to 120 knots, trying to push to the north. The issue is the cutoff for California, for most any sort of a system with sort of, that's pushing swell up from the northeast, is about 118 west, 117, something like that. And then we get another pulse of uh, energy that looks more like a trough. More winds here up to uh, barely 140 knots on Saturday, pushing cleaner uh, on Sunday to the northeast. And we'll just sort of roll this out. And you get there's a definite troughing pattern trying to organize here at 180 hours out. Now, does anyone believe a model 180 hours out? Absolutely not. But when you're desperate, you take what you can get. And right now, this is all there is. So uh, it looks like somewhere around Thursday into Friday, maybe a trough will form in the upper atmosphere. Maybe that will help support gale formation. And uh, maybe that will help generate swell. Let's dig into the surface level pressure charts, see what they tell us. Here we go. Surface level pressure, surface level winds. High pressure, as expected. Ridging, pushing the jet and winds to the south. Again, doing nothing to support us. Cut off low, just as we expect, looking at the significant wave height charts. Also doing the same thing. High pressure here radiates counterclockwise. Low pressure clockwise creates, uh, creates a gradient between the two of those. Isobars get tighter. That generates wind pushing to the south. No support for swell pushing to the north. Anyway, we'll roll this out. We'll just, you know, we kind of know what the drill is going to be here. We know high pressure is going to rule supreme for a while based on the jet stream charts. Cut off low here Can, uh, on Thursday. Uh, it says up to 40 knot winds. We don't buy even 45 knots, but the models showed last week, same sort of deal, something developing in the Southeast Pacific, cut off, never materialized. We don't buy it. Then, oops, actually, there we go. Now, here's the beginning. Uh, let's go starting uh, sometime Thursday. Yep, that's about what we saw in the jet stream charts. Small gale, trying to organize here. What's that? 40 knot winds pushing to the northeast, kind of lifting, continuing up to 45 knots over a tiny area into Thursday night. Pushing, look at this, this is actually between the cutoff low here and this low, that's a pretty good uh, stretch of fetch here. These are 600 nautical, 10, uh, 10 degrees uh, to the north and south, 600 nautical miles. So one, two, 
almost three. That's about 12, 1,500 nautical miles, but, you know, there's a pretty good gap here. But still, this is good. What it does is it roughs up the ocean surface. It would generate some seas. And then if a real fetch were to come quickly behind that, the, those winds from that secondary fetch would uh, get good purchase on the ocean surface and create swell. And sure enough, here, look at this. We have a deep 960 millibar low uh, forecast on Saturday, 45 knot winds to the northeast. Uh, building, look at good size fetch area come Saturday night into Sunday. Oh, um, this is, this is very solid looking, but also notice it's 162 hours out. Not particularly believable. 45, 50 knot winds continuing out to 180 hours and in the California swell window. So this would generate a very south angled swell relative to California. Also do quite well into Mexico and Central America and certainly down into Peru and maybe even Chile. But again, it's a rather long distance projection. Zero confidence at this point in time. Let's go take a look at the wave uh, model charts. Again, wave models are the mo a model of a model. That is, they take the winds from the surface uh, pressure charts that we saw, then project the effects, and those are projected winds, right? Then it, it projects the effects of those winds on the ocean surface over time. So again, a model of a model. Anyway, moving on. We see no activity going on here, and we don't expect to see anything. We're basically taking the fast track here. Get us to Thursday. Let's see. There's our first little primer gale. Was that 22, 23 foot seas? Maybe into the, was that 20, 22, 24, 25 foot seas, something like that. Also, notice a little bit of fetch here pushing up the Tasman Sea if you're on your way to uh, Fiji. Maybe some swell from that. Also, uh, what do we got? 22, uh, 20, 22, 24, 26 foot seas. You know, this in and of itself could generate a 14, 15 second period swell. Nothing huge, but it is, that's just the primer. This is the real system starting Friday night into Saturday. And then we have, what's that? 32 foot seas and starting to build in coverage. 33 foot seas. And look at this guy blow up here. Not huge seas, 33 feet. Uh, then building to 34, almost 35 feet into Sunday, continuing. Again, the cutoff is over here relative to California. So a good amount of energy pushing to the targets that we talked about before. And there we are at 180 hours. So notice we're just going to roll this back real quick. Not only does it start south, but watch how it pushes. It pushes to the northeast, basically. Uh, main target right in here, Central America, and uh, we would say uh, uh, Peru, but certainly Mexico could do pretty well if all this were to materialize. Of course, this is, again, a long ways away. Next, we take a look at what else has happened over the past week, and we're back to Sunday a week ago, and we talked about this system. Small system developed under New Zealand, or actually southwest of New Zealand, seas building to... 40 feet, 42 feet, almost 43 feet, and then fading. This was a Monday into Tuesday, but let's go back. Let's watch this. It is the track. It moves from here down to here, and it should be going from here up to here if it's going to get good exposure for Hawaii and California. Really, the the the, the Tra direction of travel of the storm needs to be pushing to the northeast instead it's falling southeast that doesn't do much for us seas are good size but the expectation is hawaii will see next to nothing from this and the u.s west coast maybe 1.4 feet at 16 or 17 seconds just you know just background energy and then we'll just roll through the rest of the week and get us up to current and nothing really happened in between there. Now, notice there is this little system on Saturday that developed off of uh, uh, Chile aimed north, maybe good for Mexico, almost northeast, 28 foot seas, and that was about it. Maybe some very, very southeast angled swell for exposed breaks in Southern California, but we're just basically saying nothing significant from it, but we'll see. So basically what that means is we had that one southeast falling system under New Zealand. Tiny swell was in the water. After that, nothing. Maybe the little uh, bit of swell, southeast swell for exposed breaks, Southern California. And then pretty much nothing until and assuming the storm 
that forms in the Southeast Pacific actually materializes. So the short of it, probably a pretty long run. We've had swell this past weekend, probably not a whole lot going on until, you know, basically a, a wave drought for a while. So then the one savior relative to Hawaii and California is always wind swell, especially this time of year. Early in the summer, uh, wind swell potential is more likely. The deeper you get into summer, then the, the, the uh, Gulf high or the Northeast Pacific high tends to mellow out a little bit as you start moving towards fall. And then even wind swell disappears. Uh, and of course, during La Nina years, this being a, a weak La Nina year, high pressure tends to be stronger. And so the high pressure is really what drives your wind swell. It's like this, a 1030 millibar high pushing up against the California coast. Heat inland creates a heat low. As the high gets closer to the heat low, the isobars get tighter. That generates wind, and of course, that generates wind swell. Same deal relative to Hawaii. You don't have the gradient, but you get sometimes fetch off the south and southeast side of this high. That's what always what's generating trades, but you need the high to get, you know, just set up just right. Fetch builds 15 knots or greater, and then you can pick up uh, uh, east wind swell along east-facing shores of the Hawaiian Islands. So anyway, we're into Monday. Not a whole lot going on. Rather light wind pattern. We'll just sort of roll through. Notice a little bit of fetch start developing east of Hawaii from the high pressure, the uh, Gulf uh, or Northeast Pacific high. On Tuesday, 15 knot winds, very you know minor wind swell, but even that breaks up. But notice, here we go, the high starting to push towards the California coast. There we go. You start your gradient, 15-knot winds along the coast. Also, 15-knot northeast winds starting to push into Hawaii. Maybe small wind swell. Uh, winds build 20 knots along Cape Mendocino area down into uh, Point Arena or so. Maybe more wind swell. Wind continuing relative to Hawaii. Wind swell into Wednesday. And that pattern just sort of continues. It's interesting, this gradient was supposed to be a lot stronger here, even 24 hours ago. This run of the models, uh, what was that, uh, uh, the 18Z run as of today, not as impressive. And then we get into Friday, again, more wind swell things pick up, continuing wind swell, small for Hawaii. And there we go, there's the gradient starting to wake up next Saturday relative to North California. And even, notice the, uh, the islands are down here, east winds mostly bypassing Hawaii. But California, under pretty brisk north winds along the coast, 25 knots Saturday, building to 30 knots into Sunday. Here's your low pressure, the red uh, I, uh, isobars here. We've colored them red to show low pressure. The blues are high pressure. And notice almost starting to look, there you go. This is the, so if, so if this is low pressure, um, you can almost get this kind of eddy flow. It's a south wind along the coast here, uh, pushing up, creating better wind conditions for many spots in at least northern California. And there we go, full-on eddy flow suggested by Sunday afternoon with 30 to almost 35 knot winds off Cape Mendocino. So certainly wind swell relative to California. Less wind swell relative to Hawaii. And there we go. There's the final frame. So most of the wind swell, yeah, tiny gutless wind swell for North and Central California, the early part of the work week. But once we get into the weekend, larger wind swell, eddy flow, uh, south winds, probably better opportunity for wind swell. We'll take that in the absence of any southern hemi swell. Let's take a look long term. What's going on with the Bad and Julian Oscillation and, of course, with El Nino La Nina, trying to divine the tea leaves and see what the long term forecast is. And, of course, trying to make that forecast, the further you look out into time, the lower the accuracy. And it's understood. Uh, three days out, you can be fairly accurate. Four to seven days, a lot less. And and we've all seen storms disappear, forecast on the charts five, six, seven days out, and then completely disappear. So that gives you a sense of when you're trying to project a month, two months, three months out, the amount of skill that's there and the amount of precision. Actually, sometimes the models do reasonably well, but only at the grossest levels. Okay, anyway, so we're trying to understand what's going on with the MJO, Madden Julian Oscillation, in the active phase when it occurs. Uh, it tends to help support storm formation in the northern hemisphere in winter months and in the summer months. Uh, also, 
Not as strong a correlation, but sometimes it can kind of feed the jet stream and help support storm formation. So we look at winds. Kelvin wave generation area. This area right in here seems to be when you get the active phase of the MJO in here. That's when it feeds the jet stream both north and south, and that in turn helps build storms. Uh, trades, east winds. There's the equator, west Pacific here, east Pacific here. Clearly, we see trades in control, but it's the anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year. And looking across East Pacific, everything looks pretty much neutral in the West Pacific, specifically Kelvin Wave Generation Area, 170 west to 135 east, 5 degrees north and south of the uh, equator. We see, just look at these little arrows here, weak westerly anomalies, which is, thank goodness, a good sign. We have been under easterly anomalies for, it seems like, months uh, all driven, of course, by La Nina. That's typical of La Nina. La Nina tends to create east anomalies. It cuts off the flow of energy to the jet stream and, of course, then shuts down storm production and therefore swell production. But now we have a little hint of westerly anomalies. That's a good sign. Let's go look at the forecast. Here we go. Zonal wind anomalies. Okay. This is the whole globe on one chart. Kelvin wave generation area is between these two tick marks right here, that's 180 west, the international date line. So this would be the far west Pacific, and this would be, you know, still even west of Hawaii. And the blues and purples, of course, are easterly anomalies. This is up, uh, uh, this is 850 millibars. So the 850 millibar pressure level is about 42, 4,400 feet up. Um, but it's a pretty good proxy for what's going on at the surface. Sometimes they're stronger at 850 millibar than they are down at the surface. So take it with a grain of salt. Anyway, back in May and early June, you can see just a preponderance of some form of easterly anomalies. Here we are right to today. Uh, there we go. Uh, Dateline, Kelvin wave generation here, almost dead neutral right now. And then we're seeing that the previous chart we saw was actual buoys on the ocean surface, the TAO buoy array. And looking down at the forecast, generally sort of this mixed bag of a little bit of easterly anomalies, a little bit of westerly anomalies mixed up. So basically a neutral pattern. Maybe that's a sign that La Nina is dying. And here we go, uh, outgoing long wave radiation, another way to uh, monitor the MJO, that is amount of sunlight reflectivity off the ocean's surface, uh, more reflectivity suggests high pressure, suggests the inactive phase of the MJO, less reflectivity, you get these blue colors, that means clouds, that means the active phase of the MJO. Right now, inactive phase of the MJO, very weak, expected to die, Kelvin wave generation, remember on the equator, right in uh, 170 so right in there that's the area we're looking at here and basically a dead neutral pattern per this the statistical model and then we go down and look here at the dynamic model it suggests you have the same thing but then in, as we get into a week or more out the inactive phase the mjo comes in and is strong this model has been consistently showing this but you know what the statistic model seems to have a better handle on what's really going on and we're beginning to discount the GEFS model out you know six ten days two weeks not necessarily believable phase diagram charts uh the short of it is assume this to be the north pole though it really isn't you're looking down on the earth the mjo moves from west to east from the indian ocean to the maritime continent over the pacific uh, under the U.S. West Coast, across the Atlantic, on the equator, back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot is where the active phase of the MJO is. So basically, it's you know, somewhere, let's say, over uh, East Africa, not even quite in the Indian Ocean. But if you're inside this circle, it's considered so weak to almost be non-existent. The forecast is the green line. And basically, the active phase, per this, the ECMF, is, ECMF model, is to be very weak and moving into the Indian Ocean. The GEFS model, that previous model that we said we kind of discounted, is showing the active phase, the MJO, some, same place, but building into the Indian Ocean. We're not, not buying that so much. Putting things in perspective, the 40-day upper-level model, green suggests areas of precipitation or favorable for precipitation up at the 200 millibar level, so jet stream level, if not above the jet stream level. Um, and what this shows is a very just diffuse pattern. We're looking 40 days out. You see no progression of anything moving west to east across here. Whatever that is, it's almost stationary. This green's almost stationary. Basically, a very 
very weak MJO is expected for the next 40 days per this model. And then, of course, our favorite model, the, uh, the CFS uh, model, uh, up 850 millibar winds. Here's our current date. The forecast is moving forward. Uh, Kelvin wave generation area, roughly right in here. And it suggests, look at this. Uh, so here's what we've been doing in the past. And here's these pockets of the blues are easterly anomalies. And now we're just starting to move into this. You know, we saw uh, in the previous chart weak westerly anomalies, and that's exactly what we're showing here. And the pattern looks more favorable moving forward into mid-July. Westerly anomalies in the Kelvin wave generation area. And then this sort of thing develops. It's very interesting. Like there's a brick wall here, and this has been suggested for a while. With westerly anomalies building, and this is just about on the dateline, easterly anomalies uh, east of there, but it's really the Kelvin wave generation area that we're interested in. And all these westerly anomalies are in the Kelvin wave generation area, suggesting maybe a move. Uh, and even now we're starting to move into that. And this model has been consistently saying this for months, and now we're actually starting to see some of that materialize very weakly. The next couple of weeks are going to be key as we get into mid-July. See if this westerly anomaly thing actually develops. Um, but it suggests perhaps a more favorable pattern for the Pacific longer term. In fact, let's overlay the MJO. Now you see Sort of no MJO signal going on right now. Solid contours are the active phase of the MJO, but this is so weak, it's not even an active phase. Yeah, it's a tendency towards it. And there's this supposed little uh, inactive phase forecast for, what are we talking about, July oh, 12th through about the uh, end of July. That's only two weeks. A typical uh, MJO cycle runs anywhere from three to four to five weeks, so hardly even a, a legitimate inactive phase. And westerly anomalies continuing, and then a real active phase. This looks more normal, a normal kind of active phase, multi-week from, oh, let's say the end, uh, end of July, early August, the whole way through August into mid-September with building westerly anomalies, followed, of course, by inactive phase, the MJO. And here we go. Oh, maybe we can do this. Just give us a second here. Here we go. We'll scroll like this. Oh, there we go. Okay. And there, oops, you can barely see it. There we go. There's the date line right there. So you can sort of see uh, right in there. Anyway, so now the next part of this is let's go take a look at the low pass filter right here. These are where you use, if you see dotted lines like this in the Pacific, that suggests the inactive, uh, not the inactive phase, sorry, La Nina developing. So um, there's just been this, here is La Nina, last year's La Nina. It officially faded out, you know, June 12th or something like that. And then we've been watching the model play this game. Sometimes it shows La Nina redeveloping and developing more so on the date line. But notice this second lobe here, and actually the bigger one. And that is roughly, you can't see it here, but 120 is uh, right here, 120 west. That's California right there. So it suggests that... Yeah, the inactive phase might develop, but most of it's going to be over, a, we'll say, the eastern Gulf. This would, uh, Gulf of Alaska, that would suggest a drier pattern for California this coming winter. But what it also suggests is that the date line will be opened up and that you could get pretty good storm production, let's say, to the date line or even into the western Gulf of Alaska. But then the storms would not make it any further west than that. So this is good. You know, this is, again, a very much of a reach here, but what this sort of says is, yeah, we could have a pattern set up by, even in the fall, early fall, September sort of thing, where you get these long-distance swells coming, longer-period swells from over the date line, uh, but basically groomed conditions, maybe even offshores relative to California. Uh, more energy relative to Hawaii, because they'd be closer to the fetch, but maybe greater odds of some storminess, but maybe, maybe not that uh, much odds. Anyway, very much of a reach. But that's what the models are suggesting as of right now. Let's take a quick look at what's going down on in the ocean. Uh, another sign of uh, now we're past the MJO. Now we're interested in what's going on with El Nino, La Nina. We sort of got hints of that in the previous model. West Pacific here, East Pacific here. This is uh, ocean, subsurface ocean temperatures. Warm water in the West Pacific. The key thing from this chart is, the, uh, so that's the... Uh, 
what, 30-degree isotherm, the 28-degree isotherm, this is the 24-degree isotherm, and this was pushing the whole way into Ecuador in the far west Pacific, but notice it's pulled away a little bit, meaning that there was warm water pushing this way. It's kind of pulling back, but here, right at 140, uh, still the 26, uh, 24 degree isotherm is still down at like 100 meters. So whatever is going on here, it's very limited. We don't expect any sort of. We've seen no major pullback from uh, the 28 degree isotherm. You know, it, it's the furthest it's made it east is about 145, 144. It's holding steady there. So uh, basically. No change from the previous uh, charts. Looking again, this is anomalies, differences from normal. Before, we were looking at actual water temperatures, just, just sort of this homogenous one degree, this whole pool right in here, one degree above normal from West Pacific to East Pacific. No sign of any Kelvin wave, but no sign of anything that's like La Nina either, just sort of a dead neutral pattern. Higher res vo version of that uh, uh, subsurface profile again. Oh, uh, what is this? One degree anomalies in the west, half to one degree anomalies in the east, sort of connected. No real cold water, nothing going on, just kind of a generic, not, you know, neutral kind of pattern. Sea level anomalies, same sort of deal, actually. So there was warm water over in here, and we're only interested right on the equator. That's all that matters for El Nino. There was warm water building up here sort of over the equator, but it's all kind of dissipated now. There was warm water Oh, even two weeks ago here over the Galapagos off of Ecuador, that's all dissipated now. But nothing cold showing up either, just dead neutral temperatures, not a whole lot going on. Upper ocean heat anomalies, last year, same time, La Nina in play, cooler waters, this is the West Pacific, this is the East Pacific, those dissipated as we got into December, we went into a neutral pattern, something that almost looked like a Kelvin wave, but it's just so weak, this is only, what, zero to half a degree above normal, but some sort of build up here as we got into the spring along uh, Peru and uh, and Ecuador. Almost looked like an El Nino, but it really isn't. Upwelling phase of the Kelvin wave cycle, another sort of weak Kelvin wave, if you will, pushing from west to east, warm water, but nothing in particular. And here's where we are now. Just roll this up so you can see it. There we go. Uh, just basically kind of generic, neutral ocean temperatures across the balance of the Pacific. So subsurface wise, no sign of La Nina, no sign of El Nino, neutral pattern. Looking at the actual surface, so a couple weeks ago we saw a lot of warm, even a month or two ago, a lot of warm water building up here off of uh, Peru down into Chile. Uh, lately there's been cool water upwelling building along Peru. And notice, so typically you have high pressure here, it rotates counterclockwise takes uh, creeds upwelling along the coast here, takes whatever warm water is here, pushes it this way along the equator. Likewise, you have high pressure up here doing the same thing. So the standard flow, and you saw the trades, is east along the equator. Anyway, but now we have yeah, a little bit warmer temperatures along Peru, not so much upwelling, but notice this whole area out into here, which was much, much warmer weeks ago, is just fallen into kind of a neutral pattern. Even these warm anomalies there, looking here at the scale, what are we looking at maybe? It says one degree maybe in some pockets above normal, but mostly just, I mean, it's certainly not cold. No signs of La Nina, but no real signs of El Nino either. Just sort of this blotchy kind of pattern, not doing a whole lot. Looking at the trend for the past seven days, See kind of a basically neutral pattern here along Peru. Maybe cool, just um, we're looking at like pixel level here. Maybe a little bit of cooling, but also a little bit of warming here. Um, of course, clear signs of this alternating cooling warming sort of pocket trend going from the Galapagos out to about 120. But it's the, uh, uh, the main area for measuring El Nino, the Nino 3.4 region, starts at 120 west, 5 degrees north and south, and goes out to about 170 right in here. You see kind of a mixed bag pattern a little bit warmer here warmer in pockets cooler in pockets nothing strong uh indicating any sort of a trend one way or the other and then actual uh sea surface temperature anomalies again looking you see you know, weekly barely warm over the whole here's the the nino 3.4 region really this is where you, you monitor and you see yeah, it's warmer than normal here but looking back in here it's barely warm. It's almost neutral. Warm pockets, cool pockets, just kind of a generic thing going on. This uh, 
This strong warming out in here, though, is interesting off California, north of Hawaii, and cooling north of that or cooler than normal temperatures sort of smells and notice the warming pushing up the coast here. This smells very much like the warm phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. We've talked about that in the past. This is, again, this is all very noisy, and this isn't the main, it's mainly the fall. You want to really see whether that signal's clear or not. But this pattern has been holding for months, and as we've said in past presentations, we suspect we are moving towards the warm phase of the PDO, but we're not going to hang our hat on it yet. Next up, we look to see what's going on in the atmosphere. We've talked subsurface. We've talked the surface of the ocean. Now we're looking at the atmosphere above to get some sort of a sense of what's going on there. Um, this hasn't been updated since June 21st. Uh, they, they, typically, there, there's some data. You know, some of the processes break down, but the, normally the, the, these guys get on it pretty quick and get it fixed. The trend has been, though, the whole month it's been negative. That suggests the active phase of the MJO. The uh, index uh, through June 21st, 30 day average, minus 4.63. That's not a strong active phase at all. That's a minimal active phase of the MJO. And then the 90 day running average, minus 4.06. Um, pretty much neutral. If you were in El Nino, this should be down around minus 15. If you're in La Nina, maybe give it plus 10 or plus 15. So pretty much this indicates a neutral pattern. Here's the 30-day SOI mapped out, of course, back in January 2015. It was negative. This was during our big El Nino. Then we got into 2016, and we went positive. This was our very weak La Nina. And then here's where we are now, somewhere, yeah, just south of, oh, this says minus 7 here, uh, but somewhere in the, and this is the 30-day running average, somewhere south of, uh, of zero, but not deeply negative. If you want to be in El Nino, you need to be down 15 or minus 20, somewhere down there. We're nowhere near there. We're just, we're bouncing around either side of the, uh, uh, of the neutral uh, uh, line, but maybe bias slightly towards El Nino. This is where the trouble begins, the ESPI index. And actually, it's the I shouldn't say begins. This is the only bit of troubling data we have right now. So the ESPI is like the Southern Oscillation Index, measures the difference in precipitation between the area north of Australia and then north of Tahiti. Specifically here, if you have positive numbers, it suggests more precipitation, negative numbers, less precipitation. Of course, negative numbers, the current index is minus 2.17. You can see it up here. It means drier than normal air up here, less precipitation, which would tend to suggest um, cooler than normal waters underneath this region. But we know that's not true. They're pretty much neutral, if not slightly warmer than normal, which kind of makes wa us wonder what's going on. But this n index, so in the previous La Nina last year, this got down to minus 1.9, and now we're down to minus 2.17. And there is some discussions, at least when you're moving towards El Nino, that this index leads what happens in the atmosphere by about three to four months. And uh, we don't know if there is actually any good research that says the same is all true with La Nina, but we've been kind of going on that assumption lately. But this is the only bit of data that suggests that we're heading towards a continuation of La Nina in the coming year. When I say that, I do take that back because the CFS model, we, we saw that uh, the uh, low-pass filter was talking about some sort of a weak La Nina pattern, you know, uh, over California, but not so much on the dateline. So this is maybe another piece of evidence that suggests that we're moving towards that kind of a pattern. And then real quick, looking at the CDS, CDS uh, Nino 3.4 index, this is uh, ocean surface temperature anomalies. Just look at the trend here since April into current. We're at about half a degree above normal and have been consistently been that way for a while. And this is why we were saying we think we're kind of in a uh, El Nino, weak El Nino, bare minimal El Nino pattern. At least that's what it looks like, but it's got a hold for the better part of nine months. And let's go take a look at the forecast. Here's the forecast per the CFS version two model. Right here we are currently, let's say we're in just about July. It says we're at half a degree above normal, which is 
you know, this is a forecast or we're moving towards the forecast. This correlates well with what we're seeing is what currently happening. But the forecast suggests as we move into the fall, October, temperatures drop to, oh, you know, a plus a third of a degree. And as we get into January, down to dead neutral and then maybe rebounding a little bit. So there's this uh, suggestion. Other models suggest we go into some sort of a weak El Nino, but we're not buying that. The thought probably is, and the reason we're not going to move into any kind of an El Nino, because there's not a significant pool of warm water in the West Pacific. If you need uh, to get into El Nino, you need to have Kelvin waves. You need to have warm water in the West Pacific. When there just isn't anything there to fuel a progressive Kelvin wave pattern. Um, so this is probably, you know, this isn't bad. It's not good, but it just says kind of neutral or maybe at the worst. Not This doesn't even suggest weak uh, La Nina. Uh, some models say maybe a weak La Nina pattern. That ESPI index is kind of troubling, but all the other data suggests just a dead neutral pattern. Uh, we suspect, though, in the atmosphere, somehow some flavor or some tendency that looks like La Nina, even if it isn't official, will manifest itself this winter based on what we're seeing right at this moment in time. So to put a bow on it, right now, not a whole lot of storm activity going on. Maybe one tiny little southern hemiswell is pushing its way to the northeast from that of a system that was falling southeast under New Zealand all, almost a week ago. Um, after that, not a whole lot going on. Um, basically, that would be two weeks of nothing happening in the, uh, in the southern hemi until maybe next weekend or late next weekend when a pretty good sized storm is supposed to forecast develop in the southeast pacific if you believe that um so the short of it is that that swell the tiny little swell coming from new zealand is supposed to hit here in california hawaii let's just say the early part of this week and after that pretty much two weeks of nothingness other than wind swell wind swell projected mainly for california for the coming weekend uh, little bits of easterly wind swell relative to Hawaii. Looking beyond that, MGO pretty much weak, not a whole lot going on there. Uh, looking beyond that into El Nino, La Nina, uh, you know, a sense that maybe this fall we could start getting some westerly anomalies, but at the same time, no clear, no, no warm water buildup in the West Pacific, no uh, hope for Kelvin waves, no help for any El Nino, probably just a neutral, pa a neutral pattern biased slightly La Nina is probably the sense for the coming fall, which means, you know, nothing really crunching the atmosphere, nothing, hel you know, nothing helping it, nothing hurt hurting it, just kind of dead. But it seems like the atmosphere, when... It's pushing either strongly one way, either towards La Nina or El Nino. That's when you get good storm development in fall and winter months. And when you're kind of in this dead zone, which we appear to be in a recharge mode, and that's really what's going on. The atmosphere is recharging after a massive discharge of energy, two years of El Nino. And we're going to pay for this for a couple of years. But if you don't get some major rebound and some massive La Nina kind of thing, that actually is not a bad way to go. Just nothing to get super excited about. What that says is, yes, you can still have strong storms. They can develop. But the probability is just not as high. There's no big forcing factor in the atmosphere. The one thing we haven't talked about is the PDO. We're not going to talk about it in depth. But say right now. We're still along the opinion that we're probably moving towards the uh, warm phase of the PDO. And that, over time, helps to enhance, uh, feeds the jet stream, and helps support storm formation in winter months. So all hope is not lost. Certainly, we're in, you know, on a 1 to 10 scale, we're 5 right now, which isn't a bad place to be. That's pretty good. And 5 looking up, not 5 looking down. So... That's it for this week. We'll do it again next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks for watching.